Hello and welcome back to Euro Football Daily. Today we have a very special list for you. Five more tactics which revolutionised the game. Let's go. Five. Fewer forwards, more defenders. These days Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp are considered among the foremost attacking coaches in the world, but their aggression pales in comparison to football's early sides. While the average football match sees 2.6 goals today, back in the 1890s it was over 4.5, with teams often playing seven attackers. But as the 1800s turned into the 1900s, sides realised that a more balanced approach would allow them to defend more sturdily and maintain attacking power. The 2-3-5, or Pyramid, was soon the most popular formation, delivering two Olympic gold medals and the 1930 World Cup to Uruguay. With just two defenders staying in front of the keeper, they became known as fullbacks, which is why modern wide defenders have that name, despite getting forward more than centre-halves. It also explains why those players traditionally wear the numbers 2 and 3, because the team was numbered from the back, with the keeper obviously taking number 1. Italy adapted the system, dropping two of the forwards into the half spaces behind the front three and won the next two World Cups. If you've ever wondered why table football has just two defenders, five midfielders and three attackers, you can thank Italy manager Vittorio Pozzo, who coached the Aturi from 1924 to 1948. By the 1950s, tacticians in Brazil and Hungary, like Bela Gutmann, who would lead Benfica to two European Cups, were experimenting with back fours and a relatively conservative four players up front. Increased standards of fitness enable teams to use a 4-2-4, the two midfielders performing both attacking and defensive roles. The fullbacks became more sophisticated too, racing up and down the flanks to create overloads, a trend perfected and epitomised in right-back Carlos Alberto's legendary 1970 World Cup final goal. The wide forwards gradually moved back into the midfield, producing a 4-4-2, which lasted until the early 2000s, when teams started fielding a single forward and choosing to dominate the midfield instead. As a result, in 2003, Carlos Alberto Pereira, a different one who had managed Brazil to triumph at the 1994 World Cup, predicted that the most popular formation in the future would be 4-6-0. And when Guardiola moved Leo Messi into the false nine role with his famous Barcelona side, he completed a century-long story. The path from seven forwards to none. Four, pass and move. The first and most famous set of rules in football came in 1848, when students at Cambridge University got together to agree how the game should be played. At the meeting were representatives from some of England's most famous schools who all had their own version of the sport and their disagreements would end up shaping not just football, but other games too. The attendees from rugby school felt that players should be allowed to carry the ball, while others wanted the rules to permit hacking, essentially kicking an opponent to stop them. The split led to the creation of two separate sports, rugby football and association football. Rugby was often nicknamed rugger, and football was called soccer. So next time you get annoyed with an American calling the game soccer, remember it's actually the fault of the English. And the discord wasn't at an end there. At schools like Eton and Harrow, forward passing was not permitted, meaning that the player with the ball had to dribble to get his team up the field, and passing was a last resort. Meanwhile, Charterhouse and Westminster wanted to encourage passing and ended up convincing the Football Association to back their system, creating a version of the offside rule which allowed for passing forwards. And the decrease in the number of attackers had an effect too. Teams began to realise that they could drop players into the midfield and keep possession. Man marking was the fashion at the time and defenders would follow their man away from goal, leaving space for runners and balls over the top. As balls became lighter, technical ability improved and the best teams were distinguished by their combination play, with Brazil, the Netherlands, Barcelona and Ajax the most admired practitioners of possession football. Faced with a fluid and interchanging attack, defenders had to develop their own weapon, and they came up with it. 3. Zonal Marking The false nine is not a new tactic, but its effects are still changing the game today. In the 1930s, Austria were the best side in the world, with Matthias Sindelar leading the line. Nicknamed the Mozart of football, Sindelar was a small and thin man, unusual at the time, who still managed to rip teams apart. In his 43 appearances for Austria, he scored 26 goals, but his innovation was in dropping into the centre of the field. That would draw out defenders and cause mayhem in the back line. And 20 years later, Nandor Hidic Kuti was doing the same thing for Hungary. The Magyars beat England, then considered one of the world's best, 6-3 at Wembley in 1953, and the next year beat them 7-1, with Hidic Kuti's movement allowing Ferenc Puskas and Sandor Kokshis to run riot. 
Pushkas scored a brace in both games. Coaches began trying to solve the problem of marking players without disrupting the defence, and zonal marking was born. The basic idea was that you covered an area rather than a man, and defenders would hand off attackers to one another as the player moved from zone to zone. The Brazilians actually mastered it first, winning the 1958 World Cup, but they didn't realise how much they were changing the game. Football had previously been simple, as every player had their opposite number, and they just had to get the better of that opponent to win the game. But now, players were expected to think about what they were doing to communicate with their teammates and pay attention to how space opened and closed on the pitch as the teams moved around it. Suddenly, sides made up of bad players had a weapon against the big teams, denying them opportunities by sticking to a rigid plan, and reading the game was as important as height or speed. But progress was gradual. While British football stuck to old-fashioned match-ups across the back line, Arrigo Sarchi took Milan to consecutive European Cups in the late 80s using a zonal style. The coach, who's Rosaneri, conceded just 85 goals in 132 Serie A games over four years, made his whole team defend, saying that his forwards should never be more than 25 metres in front of the back line. And after one of his star forwards complained about the work expected of him, Saatchi made 10 attackers play against four defenders and a keeper to show what a few organised players could do. In the words of Saatchi himself, they had 15 minutes to score against my five players and the only rule was that if we won possession or they lost the ball, they had to start over from 10 metres inside their own half. I did this all the time and they never scored. Not once. These days, most teams use zonal marking in open play and a combination of zonal and man marking at set pieces. Tell your Dao we're sorry, but zonal is probably older than he is. And it's here to stay. 2. Juego de Posición Zonal marking initiated a larger conversation within football. What was the most efficient way to cover the field with the players available? While simple lineups just assigned men to vague areas of the field, sophisticated coaches began looking for ways to take randomness out of the game marshalling their teams into a single unit, which knew how to behave in any situation. When explaining his zonal defence, Saatchi once said, all of our players always had four reference points. The ball, the space, the opponent and his teammates. Every movement had to happen in relation to these reference points. That meant that the formation was not set in stone, but changing all the time. Over time, it became clear that if the question was where should this player be, the answer was not on the left wing or inside the box, but wherever there is space. Juego de posición, or positional play, is an attempt to make finding space second nature. By having the team make constant adjustments, a manager could ensure that he always had numerical superiority, whether in defence or attack, and that his players were never isolated from one another. Pep Guardiola's Barcelona was perhaps the best known example of positional play. By involving the keeper in build-up play and packing the midfield with technically proficient footballers, Barca could escape pressure and pull their opposition apart by taking them out of the game with quick, short passes. And when they lost the ball, the opponents who won it would already be surrounded by Barca players, who could counter-press, i.e. try to win it back quickly. Or, as Johan Cruyff put it, Barcelona don't have to run more than 10 metres as they never pass the ball more than 10 metres. The idea brought Pep three titles in two Champions Leagues at the Camp Nou and spawned a host of imitators, from the good Sarri's Napoli to the mixed Laudrup Swansea to the erratic Paco Hemes' Rayo Vallecano. But while positional play may not guarantee success, it's changed the game and it seems unlikely that football will ever return to what it was before. 1. Exploiting the rules Football is a low-scoring game compared to others, like American football and basketball, and as a result, the margins are finer than in almost any other sport. And the money in the game means the stakes have never been higher. A single goal in the Premier League has been valued at roughly £2 million, while Fulham's 2018 Championship playoff victory over Aston Villa will bring the club around £170 million in prize money and TV rights. With so much at stake, you have to get an edge where you can, and that means exploiting the rules to their fullest extent. For example, referees tend to punish fouls more harshly as they get closer to goal, and as a result, many teams now rely on their forwards to break up possession early on. In the 2017-18 Premier League, Deli Ali, Harry Kane, Alvaro Morata, Paul Pogba and Roberto Firmino all ranked in the top three at their club for fouls committed, while Swansea's Jordan Ayew was second in the division for fouls, but was carded just twice in 36 appearances. Purists may hate this kind of game in the system, but Pep Guardiola has often led the way. During Man City's 4-1 demolition of Tottenham in December 2017, the Spurs players pushed up high to prevent Edison playing out from the back. 
To counter this, the City forwards ran deep in the Tottenham half in the knowledge that they couldn't be offside from a goal kick, meaning the Spurs defenders dropped to cover them, leaving a huge space in midfield. Edison would clip the ball into the centre of the park and City were on the attack immediately, racking up 20 shots and 11 on target, while Pochettino's side waited nearly an hour to test the Brazilian. In the same way that the quality of shooting in the NBA led to the Houston Rockets adopting an offence based almost purely on attempting three-pointers and reaching the NBA Finals in the process, long throws, set-piece routines, tactical fouling and blocking off the keeper are changing the game and are already deciding titles. Though it may seem like the spirit of the rules has been forgotten, it shows that football never stops evolving. Who knows what we could be watching in two decades' time. So that was our part two of tactics that are revolutionising football. But what would you like to see us speak about next time? Let us know in the comments below. If you've liked this, do hit the like button, please. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. See you next time. Thanks for watching.